Welcome to the ONC Health IT Certification Program Developer Roundtable. My name is Jennifer Gillison with Kaufman Associates and will be assisting with the logistical support for this Zoom session. At the bottom of your screen is the Zoom menu bar. Here you will find the Q&A box. We encourage you to use this feature to submit any questions during the meeting. We will leave time uh, for Q&A after the presentation. If you need technical assistance during the session, please type that issue also into the Q&A box and one of our techs will respond to you. Please be aware that today's session is being recorded. Closed captioning is available by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. All phone and computer lines have been muted and I will now turn it over to Rob. Thank you and welcome everybody to what is the second of uh, what is intended to be a regularly recurring roundtable series that the certification and testing division here at ONC is hosting around the ONC Health IT certification program. Uh, we're trying to do these on a quarterly basis. Uh, the purpose of these meetings is really to provide you in the health IT developer community with some program education, covering some of the clarifications that we may have made and any important updates that we have may have released. My name is Rob Anthony. I am the director of the certification and testing division, and we run the health IT certification program for ONC. Um, uh, this year, especially, um, there are a lot of things for all of you who will participate in the program to do. There are updates to many of the certification criteria through the CURES update. Some of those are minor updates. Some of those are major and significant changes that have to be made available to your customers by the end of the year. So we're going to use uh, spaces like this and some other things like webinars and some program materials that we'll put out like fact sheets uh, and, and listservs that we send out to all of you to communicate with all of you throughout the year as we build up toward the end of the year and making all of those things available. We are going to do some Q&A um, at the end of this, but I will say the purpose of this roundtable is not specifically to do a, a question and answer and back and forth. If you have program related inquiries, I, um, I heavily encourage people to use the JIRA system to submit those program related inquiries. Uh, and in fact, if you have uh, program related inquiries here or inquiries about how to meet a specific certification criteria, we may direct you to JIRA. We're going to show that link later in the uh, uh, session so everybody will see it. That is the official way that we deliver um, responses to folks. Um, if we can back up one slide just to take a look at the agenda, you'll see that we have a, a full slate of things. We're going to talk a little bit about CHAPEL, uh, some of the uh, attestation uh, condition of certification, that upcoming deadline on April 1st. We'll talk a little bit about um, uh, APIs and Inferno and all of the developments that are happening there. Um, some of you may have seen that we um, uh, announced the launch of Inferno Release 2.0. We put that out on the Health IT Buzz blog yesterday. Um, it has a new, slightly new name, the G10 Standardized API Test Kit. Um, I just want to assure people who may not have been in the loop about this or may not have paid attention to some of the messaging that we've been doing, um, we did take special care to ensure that the uh, the test scenarios and the tests that are supported in this new release at Inferno are, are the same as the previous release, the uh, Inferno Program Edition Release 1.9. Um, we are also recommending to the uh, uh, authorized test labs and uh, developers themselves that they continue to support that certification for that previous uh, edition through at least one more release cycle, which is approximately a month. Um, but we're going to continue to host that program addition alongside the new release. Um, I think the important thing to sort of keep in mind here is this is probably more of a, uh, a rebranding exercise for us than it is a change to anything that you're going to have to do with Inferno. Uh, I would encourage those who are interested uh, to learn more about Inferno to maybe engage with our monthly Inferno Tech Talks. We do those on the second Wednesday of each month at 1 p.m. There is, in fact, one that is following this meeting. Um, we'll send out some more information about that overall. Um, and we can go to the next slide here. We've got, as you can see, a full slate. We've got some folks from uh, our different branches, our program admin branch. We have uh, Nana Martinson and Papia Paul, who will be talking about Chapel. Um, and our tools and testing branch 
we'll be talking about some of the API Inferno related work. We have uh, John Bender, Keith Carlson, and Scott Bell, and I'll be talking through all of that. So again, thank you all for coming. We are encouraged to see so many of you here. Um, I do want to assure everybody that the slides will be made available later, as will the recording. Uh, so you will have access to all of those uh, at a later date. Um, and I will then um, move forward and we will turn it over to Nana Martinson to discuss um, Chapel. Thank you, Rob. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nana Martinson. I am a public health analyst with the Chapel team here at ONC. Um, and today I'll be using this time to provide a quick overview of Chapel and how developers can create an account and navigate the Chapel um, in order to facilitate um, submissions for attestation requirements. Um, and as a reminder, the um, first attestation window opens on April 1st. Um, later, I will be turning that um, over to uh, my colleague, Papia Paul, who will touch on the attestation piece. Um, but for now, let's just go right ahead and get started and focus on Chapel overview and developer onboarding. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the Chapel is um, the authoritative comprehensive listing for all health IT products that have been tested and certified under the ONC Health IT Certification Program. Um, health IT products are listed on the Chapel after successfully being tested by an ONC authorized testing laboratory also known as an ONC ATL, and certified by an ONC authorized certification body, also known as an ONC ACB. The chapel contains data on certified health IT, including certification criteria to which the health IT has been certified, compliance activities and their corrective actions and resolutions, clinical quality measures, usability testing results, program requirements, and much, much more. The chapel also supports the use of um, certified health IT in centers for Medicare and Medicaid services programs. Next slide, please. So this is chapel's public facing homepage. Um, from this page, a visitor can use the search bar to um, search for a developer or product, um, ACB or chapel ID. Um, using the search bar will take you to a listing page and I'll be showing you guys what that looks like in a second. Um, we also have some shortcut pages directly below the search bar in gray. So for example, the API shortcut page um, includes all listings in the chapel that have um, certified to one of the API criteria. The um, band developers page includes a list of developers that have been precluded from certifying any health IT products under the um, health IT certification program. The um, SED information page includes all listings on the chapel um, that have certified um, to the safety enhanced design criterion. Um, if you would like more information on the shortcut pages um, or generally just how to use the chapel, you may refer to the chapel um, user guide which is available under the Chapel Resources tab in the navigation bar above. And you also notice additional resources that are available under this tab, um, such as accessing the Chapel um, data. In this navigation bar, um, we also have the Shortcuts tab, which lists all the shortcut pages that I just recently discussed. Um, we have the Compare Products tab, which is um, a widget that allows you to compare different products to each other. Um, we have the um, CMS ID creator, which allows you to generate a CMS EHR certification ID, which can be used for reporting to participating CMS payments and quality reporting programs. And then we also have the search chapel tab. So similar to the search bar, um, this link will take you to our listing page where you can search by certified products, developer name, um, or ID on the chapel, as I've already mentioned. Next slide, please. So this is the listing page. Um, this is where you may search for a particular product. Um, you'll notice blue tabs on the side of the search bar. Um, there are filters. So when searching for a product, um, you may filter by certification status, um, certification addition, certification criteria, compliance activity, and much, much more. Um, once again, please do refer to that Chapel user guide um, for more information on how to navigate the Chapel. Next slide, please. Um, so now that I've given an overview um, of the chapel, I'm going to switch gears a bit and touch on developer navigation on the chapel. Next slide. So ONC has been um, onboarding certified um, IT developers to the chapel in preparations for submitting their attestations. So all active um, developers should have received an email invitation inviting users to create an account. And this is what the um, email invitation looks like. 
There is a link in that email and clicking on this link allows you to create a developer user account. Um, please note that you only have three days to create an account, um, but if you do miss that three day window, you may submit a ticket through um, our portal uh, to have us resend the email invitation or you may reach out to your ACB to have them resend that email invitation as well. And I'll be talking more about um, the portal or JIRA in more detail at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So clicking the link in that initial email will bring you to this page. Um, if you're creating an account for the first time, you'll see that create a new um, account button at the bottom. Please note that creating an account will initiate a second email invitation, and you must click on the link in that email to fully create and activate your account. Now, if you're a developer who's already um, who already has a user account and you're just receiving an invitation to link your developer user account to a new developer organization, um, you can fill out your email and your password and simply log in to associate your account to the new organization. Um, but just note that the login is case sensitive, so you must enter in your email address and password exactly as you did um, when the username and password was created. Um, so just please be mindful of the use of um, upper and lower cases when logging into the chapel or you'll run into um, some login issues. Next slide, please. So once you've logged into your, um, your account, you'll see the main chapel page. Um, it does look similar to the uh, public pacing page. However, as a logged in user, there are a few things that you can do. Um, you'll notice uh, that as a logged in user, your name will appear on the upper right section of the navigation bar and a developer link will be on the left section of the, um, the navigation bar. Next slide, please. So if you click on the developer's, um, the developer's link, um, the developer organization your user account is linked to will appear in that drop down menu. If you're associated with more than one developer organization, um, you'll see that listed there as well. So if you click on a developer organization, it'll bring you to the developer organization page. Next slide, please. So this is the developer information or developer organization page. Um, this is page is where you'll find information about your developer, um, the users that have created an account under this developer, um, and any products that are associated with this developer. You'll also notice an um, attestation section on this page, as well as a section on change requests. Uh, my uh, colleague Papia will go into more details on the attestation process, uh, but for now, please note that this is the page where you'll have the opportunity to um, submit your attestations. Next slide, please. So if you review this page and you would like to make um, any edits to your user information, such as uh, your full name and phone number, you may click on the blue pencil icon to edit your account under the manage user section. Next slide. So developers who have registered and created an account on the chapel um, also have the ability to invite additional users to join the chapel. Um, so in, uh, invite other users, uh, you want to select the blue per, uh, uh, person icon in the manage user section to add a new developer user to the developer organization. Um, once you click on that icon, there will be a new module that will open for you to enter the email um, of that new developer user. And then after you've entered their email and click on send invite, um, Chapel will send an email invitation to that new developer user um, to set up their account. Next slide, please. So logged in users not only have the ability um, to invite other users, but they can also inactivate developer users. Um, in fact, inactivating users is the responsibility of the developer organization. So once a developer user leaves a developer organization, it'll be up to the active developer user associated with that um, organization to inactivate their developer user account. Um, in order to do this, you'll have to navigate to the developer organization page um, and find that user's name under the manage um, user section and click on the blue icon. This will open um, an interface to edit that developer user's account and under the settings icon, you'll see um, that the account enabled option will be turned on and that's in blue. And you wanna do is toggle the account enabled option off to gray to inactivate the user. And once you're done, you may go ahead and click save. Next slide, please. So if at any point while navigating the chapel as a developer, um, you need to change your password, you can click um, your name in the box in the upper right side of the uh, navigation bar on that home page, and then select change password. Uh, this will prompt new fields to appear for you to enter your old passwords and create a new password. Um, you can click confirm new password when you're done to officially change um, your password. Next slide, please. 
And if you ever forget your password, and that can sometimes happen, um, and you're unable to log into your developer user account, um, you may select the administrator login button at the top right side of the navigation bar um, on that Chapel homepage and select forget password. And this will bring up a field to enter your email address um, to which Chapel will send a password reset email. Next slide, please. So um, in the beginning of this presentation, I touched on the public, um, uh, the public user guide, but we also have an additional resources, but for logged in users only, which is the developer user guide. So all of this information that I've shared with you all today is available in that developer user guide. Um, to access this guide, you have to log into your account, um, click on the uh, Chapel resources link in the top right section of the page in that navigation bar, and then select Chapel developer user guide. Next slide, please. Um, so this concludes um, my portion of the presentation. Just want to note that if you run into any technical issues while I'm trying to access the chapel as a developer, or you have any questions that we did not get to address today related to chapel, um, you may contact us via the portal. Um, to do this, you want to select on the chapel resources um, at the top right section of the page. And in the drop down um, section, you will uh, select contact us. And this will direct you to ONC's health IT feedback and inquiry portal. Um, and as Rob touched on, we also call that JIRA. And you may submit a ticket to ONC. Um, when creating a ticket, we do ask that you select chapel as a category. Um, ONC will review this ticket and we will respond timely um, you know, to your inquiries. So this concludes my presentation. And I will now turn it over to my colleague, Papia, to touch on attestation. Thank you, Nana. Hi, everyone. I'm Papia Paul, Public Health Analyst, also with our Program Administration Branch. So the Chapel Developer Access effort that Nana was just speaking to is in support of the upcoming attestations condition and maintenance of certification requirements, which I'll be focusing on. Um, and since again, as a reminder that you'll hear often today, the first attestation submission window for certified health IT developers is set to open this coming April 1st. Next slide, please. So getting into the attestations condition and maintenance of certification, the condition of certification requires that certified health IT developers must provide an attestation as applicable to compliance with the other conditions and maintenance of certification requirements. So essentially um, attesting that they are in compliance with the requirements for information blocking, assurances, communications, application programming interfaces or APIs, and real world testing, which I'll get um, into a bit more of those requirements shortly. Uh, certified developers are required to submit their attestations during the first 30-day window, beginning again this coming April 1st, 2022, and running through April 30th. Uh, and they'll be attesting to their compliance with the other conditions for the attestation period from June 30th, 2020, which was the effective date of the ONC Cures Act final rule, through March 31st, 2022, which of course is the day before that uh, first attestation window opens. And again, this is an irregular attestation period due to the publication dates of the ONC Cures Act final and interim final rules. A regular six month attestation period commences um, with the following attestation window opening on October 1st, 2022 and continues thereafter. So alternating between April and October of each year. And uh, this brings us to the maintenance requirements. So wherein the developer is required to submit their attestations every six months during a similar 30 day window to attest to their compliance with the conditions and maintenance of certification requirements as they apply for the previous six months. And the attestation CCG or certification companion guide is referenced here um, as more information on the attestations. It's available as a resource uh, currently. Right, next slide, please. So the attestations themselves require certified health IT developers to indicate their compliance, non-compliance, or inapplicability as they apply to health IT developers and their certified health IT for the specified conditions and maintenance of certification requirements. So as I just mentioned, this would be for information blocking, assurances, communications, APIs, and real-world testing. It's important to keep in mind that what developers will be asked to attest to for each of the conditions and maintenance of certification requirements is already outlined in the regulation. 
um, and can be referenced at the citations that are also included here. Next slide, please. As mentioned, the Certified Health AT Product List, or CHAPL, will be used to facilitate electronic submissions to meet the attestations requirements. So Certified Health AT developers will submit their attestations to ONC authorized certification bodies, or ONC ACBs, for review using the CHAPL. Um, ONC ACBs will then review the attestation submissions for completeness and subsequent submission to ONC. As part of the requirements, attestations must be approved and submitted by an officer, employee, or other representative that the certified health IT developer has authorized to make binding attestations on its behalf. So the registered chapel user submitting the attestation on behalf of the health IT developer should be authorized to do so as they will be required to attest to their ability to bind the developer to the attestation. Uh, if an individual associated with the developer organization has been identified to serve in the role of authorized submitter, that person will need their own chapel account to complete and submit the attestations. So a note for any developers who have not yet registered on the chapel, please contact your ONC ACB as soon as possible. Uh, for more information, uh, developer users who have already registered uh, can also log into the chapel, as Nana mentioned, to invite other users um, within their developer organization to create a chapel account as needed. And the chapel developer user guide that she also mentioned um, has instructions on how to do so. Right, next slide, please. Um, so we'll be going through a preview today of the attestation statements that certified health IT developers will be attesting to. So again, once that submission module opens on April 1st, um, they will be instructed uh, to provide their attestations accordingly. So it will list out the attestation period. Again, for that um, first window, it's going to be the irregular attestation period um, for which certified health IT developers will be attesting to their compliance. So as a health IT developer of certified health IT that had an active certification under the certification program at any time during the specified attestation period, um, they will be required to indicate their compliance, non-compliance, or the inapplicability of each condition and maintenance of certification requirement for the portion of the attestation period they had an active certification. And for each attestation, they will be um, required to select only one response uh, for each statement. And again, here just highlighting the attestation certification companion guide or CCG that is available currently as a resource for the attestation. All right, next slide, please. So again, as a preview, because the requirement for the attestations is to attest to compliance for each of the conditions and maintenance of certification um, specified in the requirements. Um, so developers will see each of the um, conditions and maintenance of certification requirements laid out. Um, so starting with information blocking, which applies to all active certified health IT developers, um, so they will be asked to attest to their compliance or non-compliance uh, to the, this particular requirement. Um, again, companion resources are available for information blocking in the form of a CCG as well as a fact sheet. Next slide, please. Similarly, for assurances, the condition of maintenance of certification requirements applies to all certified health IT developers, so they will need to indicate their compliance or non-compliance. Uh, with the compliance, um, there are two paths here, depending on if um, the B10 certification criteria is applicable to the developer. And as a companion resource for this particular requirement, there is a CCG available as well. Next slide, please. The communications condition maintenance of certification is also um, applicable to all certified health IT developers. So they will be required to, again, indicate their compliance or non-compliance, and there is a CCG available as well. All right, next slide, please. For the application programming interfaces or APIs, um, this is specific to certified health IT developers with certification to the API criteria. Um, so they would need to indicate their compliance or non-compliance um, for any developers without any certifications to those particular criteria, um, they would need to select not applicable. Um, and for the API, um, there is also a CCG as well as a resource guide available. Right, next slide, please. 
Similarly, with real-world testing, it's specific to any certified health IT developers um, with certifications to the eligible real-world testing criteria. So they would need to indicate their compliance or non-compliance. And for any developers um, for whom this does not apply, um, that would be not applicable. Uh, similarly, again, real-world testing has a CCG available as well as a fact sheet. Next slide, please. So getting a bit more into the actual submission process, which again will take place on the chapel and will be available as of April 1st, 2022, when that submission window opens. So again, for any users that are current, developer users that are currently registered on the chapel, um, what we're about to preview here um, is not available yet, but again, it will be as of that first submission window. All right, next slide, please. All right, so as Nana previewed a little bit um, prior to this, so navigating to the developer information, um, so registered developer users would log into the chapel and use the developer menu to select the developer organization for which they are submitting attestations. All right, next slide, please. Okay. And then for the developer information overview, so this developer page is currently available um, for any registered um, users. Um, it's also available from the public facing view, but we are looking at this as a logged in user. So from the organization's developer page, a developer user can, um, for the purposes of the attestations, submit their attestations, um, as well as in general, manage any developer users. Um, as well as view change requests. Um, so the attestations specifically are handled as change requests um, on the chapel. So um, once any attestations um, are submitted uh, you know, to view the status of the attestation, that would happen under this change request section. Next slide, please. Right. So to submit, uh, the, to submit the attestations, a developer user can begin by selecting the submit attestations on the attestations component. So once this is available in the chapel, um, the blue indicator means that um, it, the submit attestations module is available to a developer user to submit their attestations. And so we would expect that to be blue during the submission windows. Outside of the submission windows, that button would be grayed out, indicating uh, that users would not be able to submit an attestation. So again, from April 1st through April 30th, um, that button will be blue. And another note that I would make here that um, per developer organization, um, only one attestation submission can be made. So for instance, if a developer organization has five users, once any user um, submits those attestations, that button will also be grayed out. Um, so that would prevent any other users um, from submitting an attestation. It would also prevent um, the user who had submitted the attestations from submitting another uh, version of the attestations. So again, just wanted to note that. Next slide, please. So getting into the submission module, again, this is a preview um, and the actual module will be available um, as of April 1st, once the submission window opens. And again, what we are previewing here today could be subject to change. So just wanted to note that, but again, for the most part, um, this is what will be available. Uh, so the attestation submission module is set up as a wizard with four steps. It will take the user through the introduction, uh, the attestations, an electronic signature, and a confirmation page. So the introduction that we're previewing now just has some introductory language and reminders for the authorized submitter. Right, next slide, please. And then the attestation section requires, again, a response to each of the five attestation statements. Uh, the requirements for each statement can be referenced again by clicking the link to the associated citation um, that we've included here. And once all attestations have been completed, the developer user can pr uh, proceed to the next step. So you'll notice at the top, we have the navigation buttons the back and the next. Um, so until the authorized submitter selects a response for each of the statements, that next button would be grayed out once they select and have completed the attestation statements that would highlight as blue indicating that you can move forward. All right, next slide, please. 
So the electronic signature section confirms the person submitting the attestations is an authorized submitter for the developer organization. So the sign electronically button will be activated once the name in the electronic signature box matches the submitter's name as displayed. And then they would need to click the sign electronically to complete the process. So again, just noting here, the name that will be displayed will be the name associated with the user account on the chapel if there um, are any discrepancies with the name that's associated. Um, as Nana mentioned, we have that chapel developer user guide that will go into how to manage um, your user information. Again, though, because um, each developer organization needs an authorized submitter, if that person, uh, if the person with the organization has been identified to serve in that capacity, they will need to have their own chapel account. So um, a person who has a chapel account um, cannot submit on someone else's behalf because again, they would need to attest to the fact that they are who they say they are um, and do have the ability to bind the developer. All right, so again, so once the sign electronically has been completed, move to the next slide, please. Which brings us to the confirmation page. So this section confirms that the attestations have been submitted. An email confirmation will also be sent to all registered chapel users associated with the developer organization at the time of the submission. So going back to our example of an organization that has five registered chapel users, um, each of those five users would receive a copy of the submitted attestations via email. Um, attestations then again are submitted to ONC ACBs for completeness review and subsequent submission to ONC. Um, if there are any discrepancies um, or further information that an ACB may need um, from a developer, the ACB will have the ability to send back the attestation um, to the developer for any corrections or again for um, any further information that might be needed. But um, if the attestations are accepted, um, by the ACB, then again, the, uh, that will subsequently be submitted to ONC. So any certified health IT developers should direct any inquiries regarding their submitted, submitted attestations at this point um, to their respective ONC ACB. Right, next slide, please. And then, so if accepted again for a submission to ONC, so meaning that the ONC ACB has received the submission and accepted it um, for subsequent submission to ONC, in parallel, the attestation status on the developer organization's chapel page will update to publicly indicate the attestations have been submitted for the relevant attestation period. So again, this is that developer information page that is available publicly um, as well. So there would be a public indicator in that attestation section indicating the attestation period for which the attestations um, have been submitted and accepted. Next slide, please. So this brings us to a couple of resources um, or several resources that we actually have available um, for certified health IT developers. So um, one of the more immediate resources that we have pending is the attestations condition and maintenance of certification fact sheet. And that will be available prior to the submission window opening on April 1st. And that will recap much of the information that we covered here just now. Um, and then the Chapel Developer User Guide, um, that is already currently available for registered Chapel users, but we will be updating it to include the instructions for the attestation submission process, similar to what I also just covered um, here today. And that will be available as of April 1st, again, when the submission window opens. Um, and then as referenced, we have several certification um, companion guides available for the conditions and maintenance of certification, as well as other resources. Um, and then we have the direct link to the chapel as well as an overview for more information. And then finally, we have several resources related to the CARES Act final rule, um, as well as a number of certification program resources and a link to the certification criteria. Right, next slide, please. And then lastly, for assistance with the attestation submission process, we ask that you please visit the Health IT Feedback and Inquiry Portal to submit a ticket under ONC Health IT Certification, depending on your needs. So 
for questions regarding the attestations, condition and maintenance of certification requirements. So this could be specific to um, you know, the requirement to submit attestations. Uh, please select the attestations condition category. Uh, for any questions regarding a condition and maintenance of certification requirement other than attestations, um, please select the relevant condition category. So you'll see that listed in the dropdown. So for instance, if you have any questions about um, the requirements, say for information blocking or real world testing, um, and again, even as it applies to the attestations, again, please select that particular condition. And then once the submission module opens, um, for any technical assistance with the actual submission process for attestations, you can select the chapel category. Um, and lastly, I would just note that certified health IT developers that have open inquiries within the portal are not exempt from meeting ONC deadlines for completing their submissions. So for instance, once we're in that submission window and an inquiry is submitted um, with a particular question about um, any of the conditions, um, for example, um, even if the inquiry were still open at the end of that submission window, it does not um, exempt the developer from, again, meeting that deadline and completing their submission. And then as a final reminder again, um, if I haven't said it enough, <laughs> the first attestation submission window uh, for certified health IT developers, again, is set to open on April 1st and run through April 30th. Um, so as of April 1st, developers registered on the chapel will be able to access the submission module to submit their attestations. And again, so for any developers who have not yet registered on the chapel, please do contact your ONC ACB as soon as possible for more information. Uh, and as always, feel free to reach out to ONC using the portal. So with that, thank you all. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Keith Carlson for the next topic. Thank you, Papia. Um, yeah, hello everybody. I am Keith Carlson. I'm one of the leads for our um, API criteria here in the certification and testing division. Um, and I'll be talking about some recent clarifications we've made to our G10 standardized API for patient and population services. Um, and I'll be kind of showing those clarifications off in the API resource guide just to also kind of demo that to you all too while showing off the clarifications. So we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, okay, so the basically high level clarification um, clarifications that we're going to cover again about to dive deep into what these specifically are but um, you know within the past I think two or three months we've published clarifications around um, the revocation of access tokens uh, we've made a clarification regarding the use of proof key for code exchange also known as pixie um, and then also made a clarification regarding the use of capability URLs um, for a, you know, a bulk data export. So I think with those, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to start demoing some of this live. Thank you, so let me pull up mine. Um, everyone should be seeing our healthit.gov landing page because I just wanna start from the beginning here and, and navigate together um, with everyone to where these resources are. So. Again, we're on our we're on our front page here. I'm just going to hover over topics, and at the top here we have certification of health IT, which, when clicked on, takes us to our certification division um, landing page. And so, again, we're looking for G10 clarifications. And so, G10 is a a 2015 edition Cures Update criteria. So we're going to go to that page. Um, and then at the top here, since G10 is, is a new criteria, um, it is listed right here. We have a link to the, the Cures Update CCG. Um, and it keeps taking me to the bottom here. Let me just go up to the top. So, you know, hopefully a lot of this is familiar, um, seeing our, our um, G10 CCG. And, and again, if you just, you can always drop down this revision history accordion here to see version numbers and descriptions of change. Um, the ones, the recent clarifications that I want to be sure you're all aware of today are clarifications, you know, we added in version 1.9 and version 2.0. Um, and, you know, these are available on this page, right? You can scroll down and find the clarifications within these um, paragraphs down here. 
Um, but I want to, again, show off the API resource guide because it also contains these clarifications and, and it might be an easier way to navigate, um, an easier resource to navigate in some situations. So um, at the top here, we have this resource documents um, accordion. So you can drop that down. And at the bottom of this list, we have a link to the um, API resource guide. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click on that. And this takes us to a separate web page. Um, and so this is like our original API resource guide we released in November of 2020. And it was originally just a, a PDF. Um, and we, we quickly realized that there was, especially related to our API criteria, just a ton of information and putting it all in a PDF was not the best way to do it. Um, and, and so we've kind of tried to rethink how we can organize this information and, and have created this, this website that's it's hosted you know, as, as a GitHub page. You can see in the URL, it's a, it's a github.io. Um, and so, you know, again, this is not meant to be overwhelming because this, this information was the same information that's contained in the, the PDF before. And you'll see that there's also a lot of, you know, similar information from healthit.gov, but just trying to provide some different ways to navigate and keep track of um, our program resources. And so one thing I do want to call out about this guide, again, since it's a GitHub IO page, there is a GitHub repository behind this. Um, and you can on the left here in our, you know, kind of navigation bar here on the left, which has got all the different pages. I'll just want to specifically call out the directory of published versions page, which I'll just click on really quick, which has instructions on how to get to the GitHub repository behind this page. And, you know, I, one of the great features of GitHub is you can, you know, track commits and, and see like line item differentials and specific highlights of like things that are changed. And so if you want to track on a very granular level what changes in this resource guide um, you can do that here you know if you're not familiar with github i have some instructions or we've included some instructions here on how to um, navigate commits on github but you know hopefully for a lot of folks github's pretty familiar and, and we just want to use a familiar tool to to make our data more accessible and our, our resources more accessible so um, but with that, again, the main goal here is to kind of show off some clarifications, some G10 clarifications that we've made. So again, I'll go back to this left hand um, navigation bar and we're going to go specifically to the G10 page. Um, and so once you go there, there's also a table of contents on the right, which we've just broken it up into, you know, these first two are just some contextual information pages and then information and clarifications, all of these, you know, sections are just the same exact sections that are, um, or like they are the sections of, um, blah, each section is a, is a paragraph of regulation in G10, just like we have it organized in our CCG where we have kind of these boxes for each paragraph. Um, we have a similar thing here, just kind of different headers for each paragraph and, and more information um, on that regulatory paragraph in G10. So the first clarification I wanna go over with you all is the one we made regarding access token revocation. So that clarification was made to the, the patient authorization revocation requirements. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click on that so it automatically scrolls me down. Um, so you'll see here that how this is organized is we've like included the regulation text just for easy reference. And then there's this drop down where you can see the clarifications included in the G10CCG that apply to this paragraph. Um, and this is consistent throughout. So this is the exact, the exact same clarifications just copied over um, to here. And, you know, this you'll see in a further example as I'm scrolling through this guide that like, you know, this section is pretty sparse right now. What we hope to do with this API resource guide is like include additional information um, related to these regulatory paragraphs. So like right now we don't have necessarily more non-CCG clarification information here, but in the future we might include some other snippets um, of information that don't rise to the level of a G10 CCG clarification or might just link to general helpful resources. And so you will find those populated here. Um, and just to make sure that this guide is a one-stop shop, we just throw these clarifications in here too. So you don't have to like look for those on our page also, but you'll see another example of some additional information when I look at some other clarifications, but you know, just want to call that out. So it's not completely like just looks like a duplicate of what we have on healthit.gov. There's, there's meant to be some more information and, and this will be a continually updated resource. Um, so anyway, just gonna drop this down and look at the clarifications we've made. And um, 
this most recent one we've published is this last paragraph right here. I'm just going to go ahead and read it out really quick. Um, so we've basically clarified that for authorization revocation, health IT modules presented for certification are permitted to allow short-lived access tokens to expire in lieu of immediate access token revocation. ONC recommends health IT developers limit the lifetime of access tokens to one hour or less as recommended in the standard adopted at 1702158A3, which is the, the smart app launch framework implementation guide. Um, and then for purposes of testing and certification, health IT modules will be tested for patient authorization revocation occurring within one hour of the request. Um, so this was this just resulted from a, an inquiry we got in our centralized feedback system. Um, you know, in the OAuth world, access tokens are meant to be short lived, and if they're going to be explicitly revoked, it, it brings up, you know, in, in a lot of cases, some complicated situations of like, is is you know a resource server going to have to introspect every token it gets to see if it's um, expired? And you know, it, it just we we looked into this further and realized that you know according to what we have in regulation, there, there isn't a specific requirement for access tokens to be revoked. Um, refresh tokens are expected to be revoked, but you know, once a refresh token is revoked, if an access token is short-lived, it can kind of automatically expire. Um, and then you, know, you can't issue, you know, new access tokens cannot be minted off of a expired um, or revoked refresh token. So um, just making that clarification, and again, this is something, this last sentence here just makes makes it clear that, um, or just want to call out that Inferno has been updated, you know, our ONC supported G10 testing tool has been updated to accommodate this. So, you know, this will be kind of automatically included there, but that's our first clarification I want to go over. And then the next one is a clarification we've made to our first time um, authentication and authorization for single patient services requirements. So I'm just going to go to this table of contents and click on that. Um, so here, again, in our API resource guide world, here's an example of like some additional clarifications to the G10CCG. Right now, we just kind of have a bulleted list of like some other helpful things that we've come across that don't rise to the level of like an official regulatory clarification, but may be helpful to folks. And so this is kind of the usefulness of the API resource guide, one example of, of some of the useful information. But anyway, now that we're here, I'm just gonna drop down the clarifications included in the G10CCG and go to the bottom since it's the most recent one. Um, a lot here. So again, this is this last paragraph. I'm gonna do the same thing I just did and, and read this out and then you know just provide some more information. So. Um, we've basically clarified that as described in the ONC Cures Act final rule, we encourage implementers to adhere to industry best practices to mitigate cross-site request forgery and other known security threats. Proof key for code exchange, also known as PIXI, is an industry standard that can help mitigate CSRF and other known security threats. The ONC Health IT Certification Program will support the optional use of PIXI during authentication and authorization testing. Health IT developers that implement and require the use of Pixie should include documentation for their Pixie implementation as part of the API documentation requirements in G10 and API transparency requirements at 170404. Um, so this is just really getting into the weeds of OAuth here. This is a very, Pixie is a um, industry, I mean, based, basically industry standard or like widely used around industry, you know, outside health, outside the health IT world um, is kind of a security feature that's used in a lot of OAuth implementations. Um, and, you know, when Pixie is implemented, it can place additional constraints on a client, right? Like a server can, you know, needs additional inputs um, from the client in order for Pixie to work. And, you know, servers would need to like, hold clients to that as a requirement. And so um, we just made this clarification to make clear that, you know, this is a okay thing to do. It's it's a general practice and it's, you know, okay for, you know, health IT developers to implement Pixies, Pixie in their um, health IT modules and require clients to use it to connect. And um, yeah, and basically at this point, Inferno has been updated again. The most recent release of Inferno um, includes now an option for um, folks to test test with Pixie. Again, it's, it's optional, so you, you don't have to use it, but if you want to, um, Inferno will then supply the correct, correct 
correct parameters to, to test Pixie and um, allow testing to continue with that. Because before it, it would, um, you couldn't really get through testing if Inferno as a client was not um, supporting Pixie. So we've added that in. Um, and okay, hopefully that's clear. And the, the last clarification I wanna go over with you all is a clarification we've made to our authentication and um, authorization for multiple patient services requirements. Um, so again, I'm just gonna jump down here and, and kind of open this up. So this is our only clarification to this um, regulatory paragraph right now. And I will start by reading it out. So health IT, uh, we've clarified that health IT modules may use access control schemes other than OAuth 2.0 for controlling access to the file, file server, such as capability URLs. Um, and I jumped into this quick, just as some context. These are our, our bulk data. This is related to the bulk data implementation guide and, and bulk data exports. Um, so the, the HL7 Fire Infrastructure Workgroup has documented expectations for the use of capability URLs with the bulk data access IG on the HL7 Confluence website. This is a clickable link that um, encourage everyone to go look at if they're interested in this. Um, for the purposes of certification testing, health IT modules will be tested for the ability to share bulk data files using either OAuth 2.0 bearer tokens or via capability URLs accessible without preconditions or additional steps. Um, again, this, this came up, you know, through actually kind of multiple inquiries through our centralized feedback system. And also we were just kind of monitoring discussions on chat.fire.org and, and realizing that again, in kind of the um, um, technology world, these capability URLs are, are starting to be widely used and it's a good solution for bulk data access and, and folks wanting to use it for you know, their certified health IT. Um, an example of a capability URL is like, uh, like an Amazon S3 bucket URL, I believe like you can create these um, unique URLs that have, you know, like a random string included in the URL that, that makes it unguessable. And so it's kind of like, it's kind of like authentication is baked into that, you know, random unguessable string and like a client can just perform, can just like access that URL. Um, as long as they have the URL, they can just access data from that um, and so folks are wanting to use that for like after, you know, a bulk data export has been started and is completed for like that final step of like retrieving the files for the client retrieving the files. Um, folks want to know if like their server could just supply some sort of capability URL um, that clients can just directly retrieve files from. And so, you know, we, we kind of look this over and, and realize that this again fits within our regulatory requirements. There's nothing explicitly blocking this or prohibiting this. Um, and so issued this clarification, but it is really, please do go look at this link um, for the HL7 Confluence page for just some more information on this. It's it's some good information that the FireEye work group has, has put together related to using these capability URLs because there isn't really much about it in the bulk data access IG right now. Um, and again, this is something that the most recent um, version of Inferno has been updated to um, now accommodate. So it's not, you know, before Inferno would always like to see requires access token equals true. If you're familiar with that parameter, Inferno would always want to see that. But now it's it's kind of changed that up to, to allow for cases where that's not always true. And a capability URL without an um, authors, without like an access token necessarily um, can be used in some cases. So um, yeah, kind of a whirlwind of stuff and jumping around a little bit, but hopefully that made some sense. Um, and again, hopefully some of these resources are helpful and, and um, we're always helpful to keep having these dialogues through our centralized feedback system and you know, meetings like this. So I think I'll go ahead and stop sharing and it's a good transition talking about Inferno. I'm gonna transition it over to my colleague, Johnny to, to go into that. So thank you all. Fantastic. I'll wait for the slides to come up.
Just one moment. And so I'm I'm Johnny Bender. I'm the uh, uh, I'm a public health analyst with the Tools and Testing Branch um, at ONC. I work with uh, uh, Keith Carlson, who just presented, uh, and Scott Bohan on the uh, API criteria in our program. Um, and today I'm going to be uh, announcing the uh, Inferno framework and uh, the new release of uh, the G10 uh, standardized API test kit, uh, which is release uh, 2.0 for um, the uh, uh, ONC certification program. So today I'll be covering um, sort of a, an overview and talk about the features of our uh, redesigned Inferno framework, um, uh, including the documentation, some web UI stuff, and then uh, some features that we think health IT developers will find useful, uh, including a, a JSON API. And then uh, we'll also be walking through um, uh, briefly <clears throat> the ONC uh, G10 standardized API test kit, which is um, release 2.0 uh, of the, uh, the tests for ONC health IT certification. This is, uh, as Rob um, Anthony noted at the, the beginning of the meeting, this is a, um, uh, a rebranding of uh, the certification tests for the um, G10 criterion in the ONC health IT certification program. This was previously named the Inferno Program Edition. Um, and we've updated the name to align uh, with the, um, the nomenclature that we're using inside of the, uh, the new Inferno framework. Um, and so I'll be walking through sort of, I'll show a demo and, and talk through some features and um, show where you can see uh, the, the minor updates that have been made to the, uh, the tests for this. Um, I'll also note, uh, as, as Rob noted at the beginning of the meeting, that um, ONC has taken uh, special care to ensure that the test scenarios and the tests um, are the same in this release uh, 2.0 as they were in the Inferno Program Edition uh, 1.9. As Keith noted, uh, there are uh, two enhancements in release 2.0, um, which, which are uh, the support for proof key for code exchange and uh, bulk fire capability uh, URIs. And uh, these two enhancements um, actually provide some additional flexibility to uh, uh, conformance requirements for um, uh, health IT modules. So uh, health IT developers shouldn't see um, uh, tests failing uh, because of uh, the addition of, of these two enhancements. So um, also the, the timeline, so, so we, we launched um, the uh, uh, G10 standardized API test kit in Inferno Framework uh, yesterday. Um, the announcement was in the Health IT Buzz blog. Um, and just to reiterate what Rob uh, stated at the beginning of the meeting, um, we recommend that ATL support uh, the Inferno Program Edition release 1.9 for at least one Inferno release cycle um, uh, to assist with the uh, transition to the ONC G10 standardized API test kit. Um, and ONC will continue to host uh, both release two and release 1.9 on in InfernoHealthIT.gov for at least uh, two Inferno release cycles, which is approximately uh, two months. And, and so with that, all those uh, announcements and stuff, um, I think we'll go to the next slide where I'll talk about um, some, some details for the Inferno framework and, and why we're excited about um, the Inferno framework. So we've been working um, for a while now on uh, sort of the future direction of Inferno and, and trying to um, build it in a way that is uh, scalable and sustainable and makes it easy for health IT developers to um, uh, uh, or, or the health IT industry to contribute tests to Inferno. Um, this is one shortcoming that uh, we've sort of observed over the years for the Inferno Community Edition um, is that we supported, you know, health IT industry contributions in theory, um, but we didn't have a great um, sort of on-ramp um, and, and easy to navigate uh, on-ramp for 
developers to contribute their own tests um, for implementation guide conformance testing. Um, and also it was uh, sort of challenging to integrate Inferno into things like uh, continuous integration testing um, uh, uh, scenarios and also challenging to integrate Inferno into external tooling. Um, so we've been working really hard to um, uh, sort of come up with an architecture that supports all of those goals um, while uh, uh, continuing to, to enable sort of ease of use um, and, and uh, clarity in the tool and, and try to avoid um, uh, any, any disruptions in, in testing. So it's been, it's been a fun process. Um, but this, this is sort of a, a model um, a, a, a diagram for um, sort of the Inferno framework and, and sort of the new architecture. Um, so you'll see on, on the right, we have uh, Inferno core. Um, uh, we've sort of separated out the, um, the core pieces of Inferno from Inferno program edition and community edition into a, uh, it's sort of a core library um, uh, tool that includes a um, uh, sort of a, a core um, set of definitions for the tests uh, that can be uh, run using Inferno. Um, and we've used uh, Ruby um, to uh, define a domain specific language uh, for those definitions. Um, and so when you're writing the tests, you're, you're actually writing in Ruby, um, uh, which makes it uh, nice because you sort of have the, the full breadth of a, a Ruby programming language uh, at, at your fingertips. Um, Inferno Core also includes the test engine um, that actually runs the tests uh, for Inferno. Um, and then uh, we've implemented a, a first class JSON API, um, which didn't exist in the, the previous version of Inferno, um, to again allow for um, uh, easier integration with uh, Inferno tests um, and um, also allows uh, uh, design of, uh, if one wanted to design their own user interface, um, they could uh, very easily do so and integrate with the back end using the JSON API. Um, and we also ship now with a, um, a standardized web user interface, which I'll show in a, in a bit. Um, and, uh, and then I wanted to move over to sort of the, the, the parts on the left. So you'll see sort of test kits in, in red. Um, we've come up with this uh, concept of um, sort of all of the, uh, this is like a container for um, a specific testing use case. Um, and th this could be for a, a specific implementation guide, like the US core implementation guide, or it could be for like the smart up launch framework implementation guide, but it can also encompass um, sort of conformance testing for multiple implementation guides. Um, and so that's kind of where the, we've come up with the terminology for the, the G10 standardized API test kit. Um, and this uh, sort of contains all of the um, uh, conformance testing from, uh, from other uh, test kits. So, um, it, it's modular in a way that you can uh, sort of, you can build off of other uh, test kits that have been released uh, in Inferno um, and sort of uh, import them into, um, into your test kit uh, uh, use case and then uh, modify them as necessary um, for your own, own requirements. Um, and uh, since, again, since this is all written in Ruby, um, it's relatively easy to, uh, sort of extend uh, the test kits themselves, and then also um, Inferno Core um, with uh, sort of Ruby libraries. Ruby's used for a lot of uh, software conformance testing uh, in general outside of health IT. Um, and so I know the, the MITRE team specifically has found it useful to uh, rely on some of those uh, external libraries that have been written in Ruby, um, but it, it sort of makes it uh, flexible and extensible for um, uh, both uh, fire uh, conformance testing, and then also um, additional kinds of uh, software conformance testing, um, like we're seeing with OAuth 2.0 and and uh, and beyond. So we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Great. Uh, and so with this, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen and just kind of go through a live demo um, of the tool. Try and be conscious of time as well. Fantastic. Great. So if you go to, uh, if you navigate to inferno.healthit.gov, 
uh, you'll see some uh, changes here. Um, so we're describing here the, the new Inferno uh, uh, framework, Inferno development framework. Um, and so previously uh, on the left, you, you would have seen uh, Inferno program edition, and then on the right, um, Inferno community edition. Um, and so we've sort of uh, uh, rebranded this and, and recategorized uh, some of these items. So now we have the ONC hosted tests and utilities and the Inferno development framework. Um, and uh, sort of I'll, I'll start with the, uh, the Inferno development framework over here. Um, and uh, you know, this little blurb covers um, some of the basics of Inferno framework. Um, and the, the two key building blocks, which I covered in the, the, the diagram just a minute ago are sort of Inferno core um, and then test kits. Um, and so if you click uh, learn more here, um, it'll launch you into the um, uh, Inferno documentation page. Um, and you'll see uh, we've, we've tried to take some inspiration from um, other development frameworks out there like uh, Ruby um, and uh, I really like processing um, and uh, have, have made it much more easy to um, sort of dive into uh, writing your own tests with Inferno um, uh, for, for health IT developers. Um, and have uh, put emphasis for the, the Ruby domain specific language on um, uh, sort of readability and, and writability. Um, and, and so you can see this here and you can uh, dive in. Um, and then like I said a minute ago, uh, we've also redesigned the web user interface for Inferno. And uh, we did this to sort of accommodate um, uh, in any number of uh, uh, testing use cases. So we realized that if, if folks were to come in and, and write their own tests, it would be really nice if they were able to uh, sort of out of the box display those tests and post them on a web page if they wanted to. Um, so as long as you use sort of the, the concepts that are defined uh, within this documentation uh, stuff and, and write this according to these instructions, your um, uh, tests should load um, appropriately within the uh, Inferno uh, web user interface. Um, and you can uh, customize the description for the web user interface here as well. Um, and you'll see here, this is the uh, uh, sort of a screenshot of the, the ONC um, uh, certification G G10 standardized API test kit. Um, I will, uh, uh, I'm gonna hop over to that now. Um, actually, one, one more thing. Um, I mentioned a JSON API. Uh, the, uh, we have a, a Swagger um, documentation for the JSON API. And so you can, you can also find that on the, the documentation page here, which is, I think it's really fun. Um, and so that's sort of a, a brief overview of the development framework. Um, and then looking at the ONC hosted uh, test and utilities. So we have the um, uh, test for the ONC LIT certification program and then other tests and utilities, um, and this would be sort of the uh, previous Inferno community edition. Um, and we still have the uh, Fire Resource Validator uh, hosted on here. Um, and so we're, we're, you know, in the middle of migrating to uh, the new um, uh, the new platform for the community test as well. Um, but for the ONC Health IT Certification Program, um, so this uh, the new G10 standardized API test kit is available here. Um, if you click. And you'll see the um, certification tests in the new uh, user interface. Um, like I said, the, uh, the scenarios, the, the ordering, and also the individual tests all match the, uh, the previous Inferno program edition, uh, release 1.9. Um, so you should not uh, expect any, any changes there. Um, we also um, uh, have the, the Inferno uh, program edition release 1.9 hosted on healthit.gov at the same um, URL, which is inferno.healthit.gov forward slash inferno. Um, and this is unchanged. Um, you can see Inferno reference over here and, and sort of go through the, the, the tests uh, as they were before. Um, and like I said, we will continue to host this um, for at least two months um, and we'll have uh, sort of uh, banners uh, when uh, we're planning on um, uh, 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 taking this down and we're going to, to stop supporting the, the legacy version of uh, Inferno. 
And so with the G10 standardized API test kit, hopefully it's it's relatively easy um, and straightforward to navigate. Um, again, all the tests are the same. Um, and you can sort of load in a, a predefined input here um, uh, with like the infinite reference server. Um, and uh, if you click your tests, um, this is sort of the same inputs from uh, if you were to run your tests on Inferno Program Edition. Um, and I know one more thing is in the way here. And then, uh, uh, you know, folks who have, who have gone through Inferno testing will notice that, uh, you know, this, this all looks pretty familiar uh, with the Inferno Reference Server um, providing the authorization screen. Um, and then you can see we've tried to include uh, some additional detail for um, the uh, uh, actual requests that are being made um, uh, by Inferno and, and sort of the results uh, that, that Inferno gets. Um, and so you can sort of dive into the details um, uh, here. Um, and we also have uh, a report um, available on uh, the G10 standardized API test kit, similar to the uh, report screen on Inferno Program Edition, um, which allows for a, a printout of the, uh, the results from testing. Um, so again, uh, the, the tests are the same, um, and uh, um, uh, we encourage health IT developers to, uh, uh, to go in and, and um, sort of uh, try out the, the G10 standardized API test kit and uh, really interested in, in feedback. Um, you can provide uh, feedback on the um, uh, ONC Health IT um, uh, feedback portal. Uh, you can also provide feedback on uh, the uh, uh, ONC GitHub page. Um, so inside of uh, the, the G10 standardized API test kit is hosted um, on the ONC GitHub page at uh, uh, github.com forward slash ONC Health IT, and then we have ONC certification uh, test kit. Um, and you can provide uh, information and feedback in, in the issues section here. Um, you can also see the uh, uh, description of the release notes um, inside of uh, releases on, on this page. Um, and uh, the blog is also available and a good, a good place for information. Um, I also wanted to say that um, in order to support the rollout of the, uh, this new version of Inferno, we're also hosting a, a month of uh, Health IT Developer um, uh, Inferno office hours, um, which uh, we will be providing an announcement um, via the ONC listserv, um, and we'll be posting it on uh, ONC Google, the, the, sorry, the Inferno Get, uh, Google Groups, and then also on, um, on Zulip. Uh, but this will be on uh, uh, Friday, um, four Fridays, uh, starting March 18th. So March 18th, 25th, uh, 1st, and uh, the 8th, uh, which, and I believe it's from uh, 2 to 3 uh, p.m. Eastern. Uh, that information will be, again, included in the uh, listserv announcement and on the other channels that I mentioned. Um, and I think uh, with that, that's, uh, that's everything that, that I have uh, time for today. Um, oh, and I also wanted to mention, like Rob uh, shared, at the beginning of the call, we're also going to be covering uh, this in much more detail at the uh, Inferno Tech Talk, which is happening right after this meeting um, from 1 to 2 p.m. today. Um, and so please, please feel free to join that. I provided a link on the, uh, the chat in, uh, in this meeting. So hope that's helpful. And uh, thanks. Yeah, and these are backup slides, so you can just awesome. All right, thank you, Johnny. Uh, hello, uh, this is Scott Bohan from the ONC Tools and Testing Branch. Uh, and first, I'll be covering the upcoming uh, US Core for beta test for the Inferno testing tool. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, so it was recently announced in the ONC blog that Inferno will support US Core 4 for beta testing. ONC is seeking feedback from health IT developers who are interested in using this version of US Core as part of Inferno. Uh, this beta testing will start sometime near the end of this month or early next month. And as far as expectations for this beta test, there will be a set of minimum items we expect beta testers to complete and a set of optional items that beta testers are encouraged to complete. 
we expect all beta testers to perform an end-to-end -end walkthrough of the US Core 4 beta tests using the Inferno reference server. And then after performing this walkthrough, beta testers should provide feedback about the experience, including discussion about any technical concerns or conformance testing questions. Uh, secondly, beta testers are encouraged to test their implementation against the Inferno US Core 4 tests. And last, we recognize that the level of involvement will vary among beta testers. We are open to establishing regular meetings to discuss the progress of the beta tests once uh, beta testing begins. Additional details about the US Core 4 beta tests can be found in the blog post on healthit.gov, which is linked in the current slide. And if you are interested in participating in this beta test, please email onc.certification at hhs.gov. We go to the next slide for the next topic. Uh, so now I'll be going over uh, Inferno office hours. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So ONC will be hosting office hours open to the public to discuss the Inferno testing tool. Uh, the goal of these office hours is to provide information and answer questions that, that you may have about the Inferno testing tool. Uh, and the agenda for these office hours includes an overview of the new release of Inferno, uh, Inferno framework, and the new features that of in, in this release that may be of interest to developers. Also, we will be walking through the new ONC certification test kit for testing conformance to the G10 standardized API certification criterion. So if you are interested in attending these office hours, uh, the office hours will be hosted over the course of four Fridays this month and next month from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time on the dates shown on the slide. Uh, information about how to register and attend the office hours will be forthcoming. Uh, that's everything I had for these two items. Um, Thank you, and I will pass back to you, Sean. Sean, you may be on mute if you're talking. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I definitely was on mute. Um, thank you. Uh, we are going to open up the floor uh, for um, opening the discussion in just a moment. I want to reach out uh, to my team on the line um, to see if there's any specific questions uh, worth discussing. Can we receive through the Q&A? Yeah, thanks, John. This is Keith. I, I was seeing a lot of questions asked about um, dates clarifications were added, so I can touch on that really quick if that's okay. Sure, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, first of all, I appreciate all the feedback for um, it's good to know if it's really important to see exact dates of um, clarifications. I'll go ahead and can I share my screen again really quick? Thank you. Um, do, 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 do. Where is my, all these windows open? Okay. Um, I mean, you, you probably are already familiar with this. Just wanna be sure to drive it home just in case. Like all of our CCGs do have this revision history dropdown, which includes dates. Um, so these dates are here on every single one of our CCGs. Um, and then with the like, API resource guide is was a show an example of one commit you can look at. So for example, in the G10 CCG in version, we see version number 2.0, we added two of the clarifications that I talked through earlier. Um, and what we've been doing in the commits, um, so this is just going back to the API resource guide. I'll go to the homepage just to make sure you understand where I'm at. So sorry, I'll do this all from here. Let's go back to the API resource guide. Um, on the left here, go to directory of published versions. And then you can go into the GitHub repository. Um, and if you want to start looking through the commits, you can click through that here. There are screenshots of that on the previous page. Um, but when you see like a commit, like added version 2.0 clarification updates from the CCG, that's specifically referring to this version 2.0. Um, and you'll also see like, that we've just included the like exact text added clarifications regarding use of Pixie, just like it's mentioned right here. So you can kind of map those um, 
that text between these two pages and um, you know this has a date on it but I understand that this is pretty this is a lot to look through and so want to make clear too that I've I know I've especially take note taken note of how easily people want to be able to see dates so that's something we can maybe look into making this a little bit easier but I just wanted to show that like right now these are a couple ways it's available um, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing thank you And then I, and I saw we got a, I, I tried to uh, throw in an answer there, but I, I saw we got a question around when uh, the Inferno um, uh, G10 standardized API test kit, which is release uh, 2.0 will be required uh, to be used for ONC certification testing. <coughs> no, apologies. Um, I wanted to say that, um, uh, so, health, so health IT developers should consult with their authorized testing laboratories. Um, for the specific testing requirements for the G10 certification. Um, but ONC is uh, uh, recommending that ATLs continue to support um, uh, testing with the Inferno program edition. So this is release 1.9 um, for at least one uh, Inferno release cycle. So this is one month. Um, and uh, uh, we will continue, ONC will continue to host uh, Inferno program edition at inferno.helpit.gov uh, forward slash Inferno for approximately two months. Um, so uh, uh, again, the sort of the source of truth is authorized testing laboratories, um, but we're giving, um, uh, we're trying to uh, uh, recommend that they give some flexibility uh, for this transition uh, since it is a uh, major release of Inferno. So I hope that's helpful. All right, uh, with a couple minutes uh, left over, we are going to uh, try to take um, any questions or comments um, using the raise hand function, and then we will do our best to unmute you so you can ask your question. Um, so if anyone has any specific questions uh, or comments you'd like to discuss, uh, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. Hi, my name is Matt Davis with DHIT. Um, I do see a number of questions in the questions and answers section. I wonder if all of those have been answered. Uh, those seem like some pretty good questions. Uh, yes, uh, so we're, we are uh, answering those um, currently um, and any that we are unable to give uh, an answer to immediately we are recommending um, that those questions be submitted through the JIRA portal, um, which if, if you would go to the next slide, um, the, the information is there. Um, submitting the here allows us to, to uh, track and triage your question appropriately throughout the office uh, to get you the best answer. Thank you. And then I think, uh, Sneha, I, I believe, so you, you have a question, is the compliance date going to remain the same, i.e. December 31st, 2022? Um, and I, I don't know if you're specifically talking about the G10 criterion, uh, but I suspect so. Um, and if so, yes, the compliance date is, is still uh, December 31st, 2022. Yes, okay, perfect. <laughs> awesome, thanks. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I and, uh, wanted to clarify here too that um, uh, health IT developers not only need to uh, certify um, by the compliance date of December 31st, uh, 2022, but also have the uh, uh, certified technology uh, for G10 available to, um, to customers uh, on that date. So it's um, uh, more than just the certification deadline, um, it's the uh, sort of the compliance date for making the um, uh, G10 certified technology available to uh, to customers, and that's for uh, health IT developers who have had uh, 
Health IT Technology Certified to, uh, to the G8 criterion. So hope that's helpful. Uh, were there any last minute questions? Uh, please again use the raise hand function. I'm uh, not seeing anyone raise their hand, uh, nor am I seeing any more questions come through the Q&A portal. Um, so with that, I just I just want to close out. Uh, thank everyone for attending. Um, we welcome all feedback uh, regarding today's presentation and any resulting questions that may come to mind. Uh, again, through the Jira portal, uh, which is linked here. Um, and uh, just for your awareness, uh, to reiterate what Rob said at the beginning of the meeting, we will be sharing uh, both the presentation slides as well as a recording of today's presentation. Um, in the near future. So do be on the lookout for that. Um, and with that, uh, I'll just wish you all the rest, uh, a good rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>